Education at the University of Missouri. He received his PhD from Michigan State University in 2012, and before that, he also received a master's degree in mathematics from Michigan State and a bachelor's degree from Grand Valley State University. His research centers on students' participation in mathematical practices, such as attending to precision and reasoning and proving. Recently, he has become interested in studying digital curriculum materials and mathematics teachers' preferences for digital resources. He has served on the steering committee of PMENA and received the AMTE Nadine Bazook. I'm going to uh, probably butcher that, but Excellence in Leadership and Service Award in 2019. He's also the host of the Math Ed podcast. I'll put that uh, link in the chat, which some of our um, UGA faculty have been a part of. Um, with that, I will turn it to Sam. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody uh, who was involved in inviting me. I'm really glad to be able to do this in one form or another. Last spring, I was actually planning to um, bring the whole family on a spring break trip, and we were going to go to Georgia. I've been to your campus once before, um, and I was looking forward to going back again, and then also bringing my family to come and see the area as well. And, you know, that was being planned right around when everything kind of changed. So I'm glad that we're able to at least get together and still um, I can share some ideas and have some discussion with you about what we're working on. So thanks, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm gonna be um, speaking about uh, some work that we're doing in Algebra 1 and it's related to flipped instruction, but really we're, we've looked at a lot of um, algebra teaching across the whole state of the Missouri, Missouri. So this is Algebra 1 teaching across the state of Missouri preliminary findings and provocative thoughts. I'm not sure exactly how provocative it'll be, but some stuff has struck us as interesting and I'm curious to hear um, what the UGA community thinks about it. Um, and I'm presenting this work here, but it's really a team. As you know, in math ed, it's a very collaborative endeavor. And so um, Zandra here is in bold. Um, Zandra and I have really been complete partners um, in conceptualizing this and, and moving it through several years now. And then we have others that have worked with us too, um, names listed here, but Zi Wang um, is our quantitative methodologist, so her work is important. Um, Dr. Ruby Ellis is a postdoc that has been a big contributor in the last couple of years. Um, so it's really a team effort, but I'm happy to share what we've been thinking about. Before I get into that study though, I just want to highlight a little bit of the connection between Mizzou and Georgia. Um, we have a history going back a bit. So Zandra, Dr. DiRajo, she's from UGA, and she's still a proud Bulldog supporter in lots of ways, um, even though she's been here at Mizzou for about nine years now. But I don't know if everybody knew this, but we used to get together on an almost annual basis. So these photos were taken from the Mizzou UGA math education conferences, which was basically just excuses for uh, the Mizzou math ed group and the Georgia math ed group to just get together and have some fun. So when the football teams played each other, we would kind of go back and forth. Um, so in the, you can see a group shot here on the top is uh, when we were at Mizzou one year. At the bottom here was a time when a bunch of Mizzou people went over to Georgia. Um, some people that were central in the relationship are not only Zandra herself, but also Denise Bangler and uh, Barbara Rees. Um, just uh, having a strong friendship and, and also pulling a lot of strings to be able to have funding and stuff to be able to get together. So maybe when more traveling is allowed, we could restart this in, in one form or another. I know Zandra would especially be appreciative of that. Here's JP, by the way, who um, has a Georgia shirt on there, but he's now a Mizzou Tiger. Um, and then in terms of our community, I just want to share a little bit. You know, we've been doing a lot of things by Zoom now, but um, we get together every Friday as a Mizzou math education group. And so this is a little bit, this isn't everybody, but this is most of our group. Um, faculty, a few alumni, and our doctoral students. So we, we enjoy things like this too, of getting together and hearing what people are working on. So my plan for the session here um, is to go through this flow uh, to talk about flipped instruction on our project looking at flipped instruction. I'm going to start with a, a few comments about the videos that are used in algebra instruction. Um, then I want to share what we've seen with the way that in-class time is used, in, uh, especially in flipped classes. And then I'm gonna share some preliminary findings related to our data on student outcomes. Um, this is very preliminary. These, this analysis of how the instruction and different features relate to student outcomes is what we're working on this year. So these are, this is the analysis that we're actually meeting about and trying to sift through. 
Um, but I'm going to give you a, just a few sort of hints at what we're starting to see. Um, and I'm definitely going to leave time for questions and answers. Um, there will be some discussion during these. I have spots where we can have a little conversation. So I hope at those points people will turn on their cameras and be willing to speak up. Um, but I'll definitely also save time for just general questions at the end. So the context of this work, um, so thinking about flipped instruction and algebra, it really comes from just Zandra and I noticing several years ago that flipped instruction overall is on the rise. Um, teachers reported a real increase starting around 2012 into 2015. Um, teachers just saying, I'm trying out flipped instruction more, um, quite a bit more, like where a majority of teachers say, I've at least tried some lessons, if not units or so, um, with flipped instruction. Now during the pandemic, in one way or another, it's probably almost all teachers have done some form or some portion of flipped instruction. Um, but also the academic community has kind of followed along and is starting to get more interested as well. So this is Robert Talbert uh, kind of looked at articles containing um, flipped learning or um, flipped instruction have really started to take off as an area of inquiry. Um, and in terms of defining flipped instruction, so Flipped instruction is characterized by teachers that invert or flip the settings in which the lecture and the homework occur, or the kind of content delivery and the homework occur. So um, instead of what typically happens, what flips is that in a flipped lesson or a flipped instruction, the lecture or the content delivery or what normally a teacher does with the students in class, that's actually sent home. And then the homework, quote unquote, or what, what we really mean here is like the problem sets or the chance for students to like work on the math themselves instead of being homework that's actually done in class there's time usually given in class for students to work on it so a flipped classroom uh, we don't really use the term flipped classroom we use the term flipped instruction or flipped lesson but other people say flipped learning or flipped classroom so flipped classroom informally would be a class where the teacher and the students are implementing flipped instruction um, the sort of short version of the way that we define it is that flipped instruction to us means any instruction where the student is asked to watch a video or digest some sort of multimedia at home as their homework uh, or outside of class as their homework, instead of exclusively solving problems as your homework. So the way we view it is if your homework assignment, like what you have to do outside of class, is exclusively some exercises or solve some problems, then that is not flipped instruction. That is what we would call just regular instruction or non-flipped instruction. To be flipped instruction, it means you have to have some sort of video or podcast or reading or something that the student has to complete outside of class. Um, the other thing that we have to add now because of the pandemic is that for us, flipped instruction, you still have some kind of synchronous component. So you still have some time where the teacher is together with the students. If it was all just sent home and it was all completed at home, that's just like fully online teaching. Um, so we're not talking about online teaching, we're talking about flipped teaching where there is some sort of, uh, you know, video or multimedia that's done as homework. Um, but there's also a time where the teacher and the students are together in some way. So this is the first discussion item I want to open up to people. Just thinking about the definition and the concept of flipped instruction. Uh, oftentimes it's talked about as an innovation, like, oh, flipped instruction, it's, it's really innovative. This is like the hot new thing uh, in math teaching, for example. So I want to open up quest these questions to the group. Um, in what ways could flipped instruction be innovative? Like, it, it's really an innovative way to actually be teaching mathematics or providing learning opportunities for mathematics. But also, in what ways might flipped instruction be a new version of traditional math instruction? So are there ways that it could be innovative? And, and really earn that name of innovative, but also are there ways that it could be flipped instruction, but still basically the same old way of teaching mathematics. So I'm gonna open it up for comments from the group if you wanna turn on your video or your microphone. So I had a doctoral student who actually did her dissertation on flipped instruction in Georgia classrooms. And um, her answer to this, I believe would be, that it completely depends on what the teacher is doing in class. That it's often a new version of traditional math instruction. That's often how it plays out, but it can be innovative if the teacher has changed their mind about what is important to do in class. 
Great. So do, do people have examples of how class time might be used in a way that's still the same or class time could be used in a way that's innovative, building off what Dr. Connor's saying? I remember in my student teaching, uh, one of the teachers that I was not working directly with, but um, just checked in on his classroom. Um, the videos that they watched were just a lecture. And then the students just worked on problem sets throughout the entire class period while he sat at his desk the entire time. <laughs> yeah, so that's why for us it's important to say like, the the learning opportunities are not necessarily flipped the like the order of the experiences are not necessarily flipped because then that one it's still content delivery first and then it's practice second right so those have not been flipped that's why we said in our definition the settings have flipped but like in that example the the learning opportunities themselves have not flipped you know like it's not like you're doing a sort of a um you know problem first and then the like content delivery becomes summarized and formalized at the end. It's not that kind of flip. Um, so yeah, I think that's, we agree that would be an example of, oh, that's, that's the same instruction. You just happen to watch the lecture in a video instead of in your seat. And then you happen to do your problem set in your seat instead of like on the bus or, you know, at home on, at the kitchen table. Do people have examples of something that would be innovative? Like, so Dr. Connor said it could be innovative if you use class time in a certain way What's, a, what's one way that you could use class time that seems like it's an important kind of difference? I guess I'm always thinking about transfer, right? So it could be some novel application of, uh, and I hate talking about application too, I don't love the word application, but it could be some, exercise that gets you to really leverage and make make use of in a new context something that was not available in whatever you watched or whatever you read about but really i'm this is an opportunity for us to um, extend a, apply in some way make use of what we learned in order to make sense of this this new situation whether that be it doesn't necessarily have to be a problem set it could be something else it could be um, you know, it could really be about how do we even make sense of what do you notice when you look at this image or this um, mathematical, this graph, this table, what do you notice based on the reading or something like that? And I'm kind of inferring from the way you're talking about it that asking that question would be like a discussion, like you would kind of talk together as a community about what we're noticing, or if we're doing a, a new kind of application or extension that it's maybe a little bit tricky and so we're going to kind of like work through it together and the teacher might guide it like expertly guide them forward is that true yeah yeah because that now is something that it's helpful to have time and be together to be able to have that discussion or to be able to really work through that investigation versus if the if the class time was spent lecturing and then you assigned this extension problem or this application problem you're now just sort of hoping for the best when they do it as homework or something um, so yeah, that might be innovative to really say like, no, we have the whole class period to dig into this because you've already seen the, you know, the little content delivery. You saw that already before you came in. Any other um, thoughts on the innovative side, like how this offloading of some sort of video or media could be innovative? Alternatively to that, the um, investigation or discussion could happen before the actual content video and the content video can be sort of a follow-up after class sort of thing. Yeah. So we, we have one person that we have uh, have data from who did that, but it's actually one of our co-authors, Mylon Sherman, who's a, who's a PhD in math education. But the way that he teaches his flipped class is they do kind of a small group investigation. They start to kind of share out their ideas. And then the video is the like capstone on that topic it's not the starting place of the topic. So that is also kind of innovative compared to just uh, traditional, traditional teaching. So that's a little bit of the context. Um, you know, Zandra and I, we basically were hearing people talk about flipped instruction as innovative 
and we were also having those same thoughts like, well, it's not necessarily innovative. You know, it could be very much the same traditional kind of ways of teaching. It's just now that it's on video. But we saw lots of potential. We saw ways that maybe you could have discussions in class. You could have more investigations in class because you have more time with the students as a community to dig into that stuff. So we weren't really in favor of or against flipped instruction. We just thought there was definitely something to try to study and to try to investigate, like, how are teachers actually doing this? So um, you can go to uh, flipmathstudy.net is our website. I have a good picture of Xandra here because um, she's the PI of the grant. We actually started, though, while we were trying to get NSF funding, we actually did a pilot study um, where we found 10 people that were flipping and we just interviewed them. We visited them a little bit, tried to just wrap our heads around what was going on. So we've, we've published some things from there that I'm just going to run down really fast. But what was it that motivated the teachers to flip? We wrote about that in teaching and teacher education. Um, and some of the teachers talked about, I want to go deeper into high cognitive demand tasks, and they hoped that this would give them more time to do that. I want to have more collaboration and instead of me talking at the front so much. I want to move that off. Um, so that was some of the motivations. Now, whether it played out that way is a different story, and I'll say more about that later. But that was the like draw to flipping in the first place. Um, we had talked about the relationship between whoops, the teachers, uh, the videos that they make, and how that relates to like the textbooks that they have or the curriculum materials that were already there. So we have a ZDM paper where we kind of say in flipped classes, the video that the teachers make ends up actually becoming the textbook or the curriculum for the course. And the textbook is kind of put away in the closet, sometimes literally put away in the closet and never used because it's actually the teacher's videos that become like the resource that students turn to and refer to and that kind of thing. Um, we have an article that's specifically about the videos and that uh, the research article for that was published in Educational Technology and Society. We also have an MTLT practitioner paper that just came out that's also kind of about the videos. And then we also have a framework for um, basically parsing different implementations of flipped instruction. Like we just talked about, there's very different ways that you might flip. And so we wanted a framework, we kind of um, refined a framework to help us distinguish that version from that version from this other version. And we've published that in PMEA, and we're trying to get it published right now in a journal. Um, but then we did eventually get funded by NSF um, to do this kind of larger scale project. Um, and the, the guiding research questions are, what are the factors that are entailed in teachers' implementation of flipped instruction in secondary algebra? So what are, if we look broadly at a lot of people that are flipping, what are the, you know, what are the kind of main features of their instruction? And can we get a lay of the land of like what they are doing when they flip? Uh, you could also think of it as like, are they more situated on this kind of new version of traditional, traditional 2.0 kind of teaching? Or when we look at the lay of land, are we finding some people doing some really creative kind of innovative things within there? We wanted to just see. Then the other thing we did uh, in the NSF grant, or we're doing right now, we're trying to analyze this, is, is there any kind of predictive power? Is there any kind of correlation between the um, kinds of instruction that we see and then and of course, assessments or um, a conceptual instrument that we've used. I'll say more about that later. But um, I'm going to kind of do like a, in this talk, I'm going to kind of do a survey of some of the ideas that we're dealing with. It's not going to be um, a lot of rigorous detail on one particular analysis. I'm going to try to give you more of a lay of land of here's what we're thinking about and here are some glimpses of what we're seeing. But to give you the broad context, um, we ended up um, getting into 50 classes with 38 teachers. Some of the teachers, we have multiple classes in the study. Um, and it ends up being 541 students uh, across those classes where we have like uh, complete usable data from um, all the different parts that we tried to gather. We are focusing on Algebra 1. So that's really, that's the course context. Um, we have some 8th grade Algebra 1, but we also have a lot of ninth grade Algebra 1. And then there are a few individual seventh or 10th graders that have gotten into those courses in various ways, but you can really think of it as like mostly ninth grade and a, a sizable minority of eighth grade courses. A lot of different school districts. So we're from some of like the largest districts in Missouri and also a district that only has like 110 people K-12. Um, so there's like six people in the class. Um, so, and, and in between. Um, we have a district that's majority black. We have a lot of districts that are majority white or almost entirely white um, and geographically different parts of the state. So before the pandemic, we were driving kind of all around the state. Um, I listened to a lot of audiobooks and it was pretty fun. Um, and then the data that we collected. So 
we have a student pretest. We have a procedural measure and a conceptual measure that we gave kind of to the student at the same time. They didn't really realize that it was two measures. We kind of merged them together into one um, test, but um, we have it as a procedural measure and a conceptual measure once we parse the items out. And then we did three lesson observations of each class, um, almost all of them with two observers. We did not, we're not allowed to videotape, so we were doing these as live based on field notes, but we would almost always have two of us there. Sometimes if it was a really predictable kind of instructional pattern, we would, on the third observation, just have one person go for convenience. But we only did that if we were kind of very confident that we already had wrapped our head around this person's instruction. We had a teacher survey, a student survey, and then at the end, we did uh, end of the school year, we did student post test. So this is a academic year is kind of the time frame. Uh, and again, the procedural and conceptual measure on the post test. So in terms of, uh, this is kind of broadly speaking, how we started to get a little bit of a sense of um, what to look for in the instruction. So we use this kind of um, three phase model. We use, you know, the shapes are kind of from the mathematical task framework, but what we broke it down as is there's some sort of at home component where a flipped class Oh, and I should say, by the way, of these 50 classes, they were half flipped, half not flipped um, from like similar schools or similar districts. So, you know, we're interested in flipped instruction, but actually we want to just think about algebra instruction overall. Um, so it's actually half and half. I should have put that on there. But um, the at home component of instruction, if it's a flipped class, that means they have some kind of video or multimedia that's assigned as an at home part of their lesson. Um, but they might also have problems or exercises. They might sometimes have no homework assigned. If it's a non-flipped class, they don't have, by definition, they don't have the video homework. They would just usually have problems or exercises as homework. Um, then we do the in-class observations. We kind of would break it down into just segments of time and how that time was used. So the big breakdown is, are they in a whole class format where everybody's attending to the same discourse or expected to be attending to the same discourse? And then non whole class format, which is basically like, you know, setting groups to work uh, or independent students in this independent time for students to work. Um, now, for us, group work meant that there was an explicit expectation that students were supposed to work with one another. And then if it was explicitly individual work or if it was kind of like a free for all, like just do this work, but it's up to you. Um, we also counted that kind of as independent work time because the students could choose to do that independently. Some of them might talk to a partner or something, but it wasn't really required that they talk to their partner or that they work in a group. So we have that big breakdown. And then we looked at, uh, we coded for several things. Again, we, we had to code these live. We didn't have video recordings, but we would code for engagement level. And then um, I'll share later a little bit about some of the features of the instruction and just the class interactions that we paid attention to. Um, for example, during the non-class work, I think James was mentioning the teacher that just sat at the desk and like work, and I'm just gonna be at my desk doing something else. Um, we, we did pay attention to the circulation of the teacher, whether they were physically kind of moving around the room or whether they were stationary, for example, at their desk. We also like paid attention to whether the teacher was initiating conversations or check-ins with the students, or if they were reactive and were just sort of answering questions if a hand was raised. Um, so that was kind of more like, um, yeah, reactively circulating. So that sort of thing. But I'll, I'll mention a couple more of those later. Before I get too much into the classroom time, though, I want to start here just with the first part of the flip definition, which is the video itself or the multimedia that's assigned as homework. So what are the videos like? We've looked at a lot of videos now. <laughs> um, so I want to just share a little bit about what we've seen. So the way that the, the lay of the land that we kind of set out for ourselves on videos is that there could possibly be a lot of variation in videos. There could be lecture videos, but there could also be setup or motivation videos. Setup or motivation videos are like, watch this short video clip and it's gonna plant an idea in your mind or it's gonna get you sort of to ask a question and then in class, we're gonna work on it. We're gonna like dig into it. So think of it as like, if it's a three act lesson, it's kind of like you could do the um, inciting incident or you could do the launch like as a video that they watch before class. Um, so that was a, a possible type of video. Um, we distinguish between format because we know from other research that um, from educational technology that these formats make a difference. So lecture capture means that it's like I'm like this video with me. If if you saw a video of me and I was talking to you and if I was maybe like drawing something for you, but like my body is is the substance of the video, that's lecture capture. Think of it as like 
a teacher who puts a camera in their classroom and points it at the front board and then does a lecture. Um, that's a lecture capture. Um, picture in picture is where there's like slides or something on the screen, but you can see the person's face. So I should say right now I'm picture in picture probably. Because if you can see my face, but most of the screen is actually just something that's kind of prepared as a slide or something, that's picture in picture. And then screencast. Screencast is like, if you think about it as like the audio voiceover. Uh, or you can see like the cursor moving around, but you cannot see the human being who is doing that cursor. That would be screencast. And just if you're curious, by the way, the educational technology finds lecture capture to be the best, picture in picture pretty close. Screencast is the worst, um, just in terms of comprehension. Um, of course, screencast is the easiest to make, so, so there's lots of screencasts. But, um, and then we also coded for the feature of the video. So we would look at the way that the mathematical ideas were presented, the representations that were used. We also looked at the multimedia design. Um, so kind of like having a clear graphic that you're kind of talking about that reemphasizes the point, making sure you don't have lots of distractions or like a really messy um, screen with all kinds of stuff all over it that's hard to look at. And then we also looked at interactivity. Like are the students expected to do anything actively or can they just sit back and like let it hit their retinas and they don't actually have to do anything. Um, so that's like the possible variation that could happen. Uh, also, like the teacher could make their own video or they could use one from the publisher or one from YouTube that somebody else made. But what we found was really not much variation at all. We found a lack of variation in the instructional videos. First of all, the teachers basically all made their own videos and they felt like they sort of had the responsibility of making their own videos because they were the teacher. But almost every single one of the videos, um, hundreds of videos, almost all of them were a lecture video. So a presentation of material to the viewer, not a setup, not a motivation, not the posing of a problem or anything like that. They were almost entirely lecture videos. They were almost entirely screencast and they were almost entirely lacking in interactive elements. Um, and I put a, this, this is a Khan Academy video, but I just put this here because it's basically like almost all the videos matched Khan Academy style, which is a lecture that's a screencast with no interaction. Now the screen cat, the, the Khan Academy YouTube videos, I mean, and the Khan Academy, like, you know, uh, digital materials, they have questions and stuff for students to do. But in terms of the YouTube videos, for us, it's kind of like Khan Academy almost uh, established this genre of video, which is you do a screencast and you explain through some math and you know, it's a lecture um, with no interaction expected. Uh, I can give you a little bit more detail than that though, because we've kind of uh, actually broken down the like segments of the video. So like, okay, you got a lecture video, you got a screencast, you know, and there's no interaction, but still you could sort of have some different ways that you do your lecture. Uh, it actually turns out they almost all do the lecture videos the same way. So these segments here, um, blue is just an introduction, like this video is going to be about blah, blah, blah. Um, orange is a definition or a kind of just uh, explication of the thing that's, that's in this video. And then green are the worked examples. And that's about all you need to know, because if you look, that's what almost all the videos are. This little thing at the end is sometimes there's a conclusion, like, uh, hey, you need to, so that's, that's what we learned in this video, or hey, now you need to do these problems as your like, next assignment. But if you look at it, almost all the videos follow this pattern, a really short introduction, you just explicitly define the thing in the video, and then you do two to four or five worked examples. That's the genre that we have you know, detected, um, in, in, at least in algebra teachers across Missouri. So I wanna open it up now for another little discussion point like what's not here? Like what are some other possibilities? Even if it, even if it is a sort of lecture video, even if we're, if we're saying, all right, it's gonna be a lecture video, I'm going to be presenting something to students. Can you think of other ways of like bending or expanding this genre instead of sort of, sort of following into this exact cookie cutter? Or I guess you could also say that you have other ideas too, like of setup videos and stuff that are not lecture videos that um, do something different. Do people have thoughts outside the box? And possibly um, presenting material, but not actually showing it, just maybe showing the definition or showing what it looks like, and then asking students what they think about it. Like, what do you think is being shown here? Um, what, do you, what do you think this is? And then kind of going, like a jumping off point. 
Yeah, and that could be an interactive element too. Like you could actually say like, submit your thought or your prediction about this thing. And if they submit that, then that's now an interactive element. They had to do something instead of just watching it. So that's a good idea. Yeah, there's lots of really nice um, programs for that, for doing that kind of thing. So using Edpuzzle or using Nearpod, something where the students are having to interact um, and can get immediate feedback if the teacher creates it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely there's opportunities to insert some interactive elements, some embedded questions, like with, even if you wanted to keep the same pattern, you could still embed some uh, questions in there that students would respond to. We did not see that. I think there was one teacher that sometimes did embedded questions, but a lot of times also didn't. Uh, instead of uh, having the teacher uh, working, like doing the work example in the video, teacher can assign students doing the work example before class, and then they can record themselves also. Yeah, yeah, nice. So these worked, these worked examples, the, all the green that you see here is the teacher being the one that goes through the worked example. So is there a way that that could be pushed to the students and then say, bring it to class and we will see how it went. You know, we'll kind of unpack how it went. Or they can post it like a Flipgrid video before class, students yeah. can. Yeah, so that's also something that we did not see, but we've actually written about as an idea is to have students make videos. Um, you know, not all students, but a lot of students have smartphones and they make videos all the time. So it's be like, hey, make a 20 second video that's about this thing, you know, or a question that you have about it or something. And so the students could be the one to make some videos instead of the teacher always making the video and like giving it out as a lecture video. Um, one thing that we talked about was like, so these worked examples are not just worked examples. These are worked examples that were talked through one at a time. So we were looking for any times where there were connections made across worked examples or connections to like prior lessons or um, like putting two worked examples and comparing them. If that had happened, we would have actually given that a different color and a different thing. It's just, it didn't happen. It was always just one worked example, the next worked example, the next worked example. Okay, I've done three, that's probably good. Like it was not the comparing worked examples. It was not um, like one thing that I try to do when I'm teaching mathematical topics is I try to explicitly compare and contrast this topic from the previous topic or like, hey, remember a couple weeks ago we were doing this. Well, this one has, you know, it's similar in some ways, but it's also different. Like that could be in a video and it was really not ever in a video. It was more just, I'm going to explicate the topic, you know, of this video. Any other thoughts about things that could happen in these videos, but don't? A big category is the setup videos. Like that would be just a whole different thing itself would be a video that, you know, launches a problem or that establishes a context that you're going to dig into later. That would be a very different video altogether. But any other what thoughts? Was, what were you seeing in the definitions? Were they comparing multiple definitions or were they just presented a definition? Did they have opportunities to make definitions? So, um, there's definitely some subtle differences in the way that the teachers kind of their style of defining, but the majority of them were basically just almost like reading the definition out or putting it on the screen. Like here's the definition, here are the components of like, say it's a, you know, a formula or a, a type of equation. They kind of just talk through the names of each of the parts and then they go into worked examples. So that the definition is not quite as uniform as like the genre overall of video, which is quite uniform. That sounds like another type of video could be like, I see all your oranges. Let me just move this are at the beginning. What if you worked towards a definition instead? Yes. Uh, so that actually JP Han, who some of you know, um, he has, has really brought that up. Like, you know, why couldn't the worked examples be something that leads to the orange at the end? He has made that same observation. Um, we really did not see that very much. Yeah, I just kind of had a question about where would it be if there was a like a proof or proving happening up to the definition. So on Khan Academy, it's not as common. A lot of times they'll introduce what they're going to use and then just start using it. Um, but as far as showing how we arrived here, yeah, is there a color for that here. Or so so um, there's a code. There's some coding that we do across the whole video. So we code for conceptual development of the mathematics. And then we also code for um, like justification, 
and integration of representations. But that, those are codes that basically sort of like we look for them throughout any of this. So in some definitions, they might give like a conceptual sort of explanation of the definition and others don't. And then in some of them, they might give like justifications and multiple representations during the worked examples and then others don't. So that one we capture by actually giving a different code to the video overall. That's a great question. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably all I have time to say about that part of it. Now this is all algebra one. So I should say this genre that we feel like we're detecting, it could be maybe just a genre of algebra videos and maybe in geometry people start to do something different or maybe in higher math they do something different. My like, my hypothesis would still be that some features of this genre are still true in geometry and still true in calculus, but I can't say that definitively because we've only looked at algebra one. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, we did have an article this year in mathematics teacher um, learning and teaching um, that talks about, we actually had two articles, but the, this one talks specifically about videos and we suggest like not having them be too long. Um, the shorter, the better, um, especially if you want the students to actually watch it. But then we talk about them, like the teacher doesn't have to make the videos. You can like use videos that already exist if you find a good one that's on a topic. Um, although teachers really feel like they have to. Um, and I know they have pressures from parents and stuff and students, so that's, that's tricky. But we try to give them a little bit of at least, we give them some license that like, if there's some other good videos, don't feel bad if you use those existing videos. Um, we also talked about like you brought up, um, Halil, the having students make videos. We talk about, embedding or using some interactive things and we talk about the idea of maybe using setup for motivation videos for example dan meyer has some setup videos where you watch this video of a basketball shot and then the video stops and you go to class and in class you try to figure out how you can model that curve to see if it goes in um, and there's a there's one teacher that we are aware of who does a setup video sometimes like this video of a plane landing really close to a beach i think this is in northern europe or something um, and then that the students watched that video and then they came to class and they used trigonometry to try to figure out um, like the angle, how close that plane actually was to the beach goers. Um, that was a high level math class though. But it is possible to have set up videos. We just really have not seen one in the hundreds and hundreds of videos in our NSF study. All right, let's, uh, let's move into class time. Um, how is the class time used? And like Dr. Connor was saying, this might be sort of the most important part about whether you're innovative or whether you're kind of doing some of the same old things with flipped instruction. We agreed when we started the study, we thought really the video might have a marginal impact, probably won't have an impact. We were thinking it's much more important about how you use the class time. So when we looked at the existing literature, we saw people who were just like advocates for flipped instruction and they were talking about, you know, what you might do with it. In the literature, we saw people just giving anecdotal descriptions of how they do flipped instruction. And we saw a few empirical studies, and now there's a few more empirical studies, but they basically just holistically just compare flipped instruction to non-flipped instruction. Like they'll just say, we had a calculus class, this section was flipped, that section was not flipped, let's see who did better at the end. So it's like a horse race kind of thing. These are some that did it in uh, high school math, algebra and geometry. But they just, in the article, they just sort of had a flipped class and had a non-flipped class, and then they just compared them at the end. So we had this big question of like, but what are they doing? Like, we need more detail about how they're flipping. We also need detail about how the other people are not flipping. So as we've already talked about here, flipped instruction is not a unified pedagogical strategy. There can be lots of different implementations. And so we think that's why there might be contradictory results is because people can flip very differently. And in some ways you might get positive results, in some ways you might get negative results. And it's not that helpful to just say flipped overall as if it's one holistic thing. So we argued, and in our study, we tried to do this, that if you're gonna investigate the effectiveness of flipped instruction, you have to attend to the specific features of how it's implemented. And while you're doing that, you should also attend and give details about the comparison non-flipped classes. It's like, what is it that the non-flipped classes are really doing with their class time and their homework? And also in detail, what are the flipped classes doing with their class time and with their homework? Because the way that they do it probably matters. Um, and again, here's our framework to kind of lay it out. How, you know, what kind of video do we have? How is the class time used? And is that influencing whatever student outcomes you might be um, interested in? A lot of flipped research, it's always two things. It's like their total score in the class, like their achievement in the class. And then it's usually their attitude towards math. Those are often the two things that are reported. 
But what we try to do is we try to give more detail about what really is in the homework, what really is in the class time. So what we looked for in class time um, is we looked for just behavioral engagement, like are the students on task, paying attention, do they seem to be? Um, and then we have some features like, uh, is there a focus to the lesson? Is there a rationale for the lesson? Is there a flow um, between the segments of the lesson? Some of the stuff I've already mentioned, conceptual development of the math, justifications. Is there an integration of mathematical representations or not? Um, we did keep track of just if there are mathematical errors uh, and if they're unmitigated. And then we looked for this connections to prior or future math ideas. Um, so those were some of the things and we kind of just coded them on like a zero if it was at completely absent and then like a one, two, three um, from sort of like, you know, low to high kind of quality in those areas. We also paid attention to these descriptive features that there's debate in the mathematics community about whether these are like positive or negative things, but we all kind of agree that it's at least different. So we would, we would um, mark whether it was more of a teacher authority kind of lesson or if it was a shared authority lesson. Um, we, we marked whether there was low student involvement in the discourse, um, so like it's mostly the teacher talking versus if it's high student involvement. Um, we also looked at, <clears throat> looked at the nature of the discourse. So was it like a sharing discourse where somebody's always just saying their idea and others are supposed to receive the idea versus collaborative discourse where you're trying to build meaning together? And then we also kept track of just if the video was explicitly used or shown or uh, referred to like it during the in-class time. Um, I could definitely say more. You can feel free to ask questions about this, but we, we, div we divided these as normative features. We scored like one, two, three, where there's like a consensus that one is worse and a three is better. And we tried to confirm that in the data. These ones though, we just coded it as qualitatively different things. So teacher authority and sharing discourse is a different sort of thing than shared authority, collaborative discourse. But we in our design actually did not try to average it together with the normative features. And we also didn't try to say that one was necessarily better than the other because um, there's disagreement in scholarly communities about that. And, uh, and it's kind of fun on our advisory board, we have people from both sides. So it's fun to actually have discussions and get feedback from them. Uh, in the non-class, uh, the non-whole class, um, like I said, we distinguish between group work versus individual work. And then what we looked at there was, we didn't look at the details of what they were talking because we couldn't videotape or audio record. This was just live field notes, but we could keep track of just the general behavioral engagement during the work time, whether they were talking to peers or not, like whether it was silent or whether it was like interaction happening, whether they pulled up computers and like actually referred to the videos and then a cognitive demand of the tasks. And I should say other than the video stuff, this is what we observed for in all of the classes, the flipped classes and the non-flipped classes. The video stuff though is only applicable to the flipped classes. So just to give you a couple little icons. So when we're thinking about our whole data set, we have flipped classes and non-flipped classes. So the homework could be a problem set or the homework could be a video. Uh, and then during class, you might have a whole class discourse where the teacher and the students are talking together. You could have independent work where you're kind of like, um, off on your own, just a student working diligently. And you could have small group work where there's an explicit expectation that the students are supposed to be working with a group. So we have uh, we've found two pretty clear profiles of the ways that flipped instruction has happened. And this was just teachers doing flipped instruction on their own. We were not telling them what to do. We were just observing what they did. So the first profile is probably the most common one. And it's one that you guys mentioned as not being very innovative. But a lot of the flipped classes they assigned a lecture video as homework. And then when the students got to class, they basically just had the whole class period or nearly the whole class period to just work independently. They had uh, textbook problems to solve or they had a worksheet to solve. They solve it, that's, like, that's the purpose of their class time. But that's not what all the flipped classes did. Um, there's another profile that uh, looks more like this um, where there's a lecture video assigned. It's always assigned before class. That was very common. Um, but when they came back to class, they would have a little bit of a discussion. The teacher might do like one more worked example. The teacher might say, are there any questions from the video? Do you want me to go over anything from the video? So there's a little bit of like a whole class check-in with each other to start the lesson. Then the students get some time to work independently. And then at the end, the teacher might do another discussion to sort of take questions from that homework or to wrap some things up like that. Um, now this is not all of the flipped classes, but the vast majority of the flip classes that we saw, they fell into one of these two profiles. Um, and I should make an extra note about the first profile, this kind of like 
you've got class time to do exercises like that profile. There was one large district that's in our study and they, um, they did this first profile, but they did it on an individualized basis. So they just have all of the videos are ready in their course system and students just progress through them at their own pace. So they call it a personalized learning plan. Um, and then during class, they're just working on problems at whichever topic they're at. So when you go into that class, the students might all be on different um, topics. Some have gone through pretty quickly. Others are, you know, maybe on earlier lessons and haven't made it through quite as quickly. Some of them will finish Algebra 1 by like February, and then they'll start geometry like March, April, and May. Um, so they were the only district, though, in our study that did it completely individualized. Um, most of the flipped classes that use this first profile, they still were doing the same video and the same problems each day. Um, they just, they were doing it like in the same room at the same time, but most students were working ind independently. Um, notice that in neither of these profiles was the group work. There's no group work in here. Now there were a couple flip teachers that did try to use group work, but it was not a very, it was not common enough that it became like one of our prevalent profiles. And really these are the two that I just had time to talk about today. Um, so if we think about flipped versus non-flipped, the time allotment was different. So flipped classes had less whole class discourse, more independent work time. Non-flipped classes had whole class discourse much more because that's the teacher usually giving the definition going through the worked examples as like a whole class. It's like the lecture. So that makes sense. Um, but even though the time allotment was different, a lot of the features of instruction that we coded for were actually very similar. Like they did definitions and worked examples. It's just one was in a video and one was live. Um, more procedural emphasis, flipped and non-flipped. Um, low cognitive demand tasks, that was common for flipped and non-flipped. And independent work time being more the go-to thing is more common than group work that was in flipped and non-flipped. So with, the last, uh, with a few more minutes here, I'm gonna um, share um, a little bit about what we're finding and then I'm gonna open it up to some conversations. So I mentioned earlier that teachers said they wanted to flip because they wanted to get more class time so they could dig into better investigations, they could have discussions. Um, we did not really find that that's what teachers were actually doing with the time. What they were mostly doing with the extra time was just giving more independent work time. So that was different than what we hoped for. Like we thought that flipping might be a way that teachers like say like, I'm gonna do more cognitively demanding tasks because I have more time with the students in class. Um, or I'm going to have some more nuanced, deep discussions because we have more time in class. That was kind of what we were hoping for. Not because we think that's the only way to teach, but just because we wanted to sort of see if that was possible and if that was something that flipped could afford. But we really did not see that at all from what the teachers were doing naturally. It was really more independent work time. Now, the use of independent work time might not be a bad thing um, from what we're starting to see in the student outcomes. So what are the relationships that we're starting to analyze and see related to student outcomes? And again, we had procedural items. We had a, a procedural instrument and a conceptual instrument, but we uh, merged them together into the same test that we gave to students. Um, here's a couple samples. You can probably guess the procedural items. They were closed responses that are correct or incorrect. Um, the conceptual items are more interesting. Like you can sort of do some interesting things like H plus M equals seven. Then what does H plus M plus seven equal? Uh, and students can actually kind of like write their work here and talk about it. Um, other things in the conceptual items, it was often it was multiple choice, but there was like a justification that was given. And sometimes they could get partial credit. In this one, you know, you have to, to get full credit, you have to not only kind of know the answer, but you have to also know like um, a correct justification for that. Um, oh, I do want to say before I share these outcomes um, that we did check the pretests and the, the flipped students, the non-flipped students, about 200 of each. Um, there were no statistically significant difference between the students on the pretest. Um, also, the demographic factors that we checked, they were also comparable um, across the two groups. So we feel okay comparing the groups with the one big caveat being the pandemic that came during our data collection. I'll comment on that later. So here's some just top level things that we're starting to see. Like I said, this analysis is still ongoing, but the flipped and non-flipped classes both grew um, from pretest to potest. I should say not every class actually got better um, from the beginning of Algebra 1 to the end of Algebra 1. Even, even before the pandemic, we had a class that um, was either kind of flat or got worse in some items. Um, but for the data set overall, the good news was students were getting better as they took Algebra 1. Um, they tended to do, 
have more growth on the procedural measure and not as much growth, growth on the conceptual measure. Um, we thought maybe if flip students would do more homework because it's easier to watch a video than it is to like solve a set of problems, um, especially because the videos are mostly passive. So it's like, yeah, just play it, like watch it and you've done the homework. But actually we did not find differences in the rate of homework completion. We did find that flipped classes overall had more positive feelings about mathematics by the end of the year and um, students in flipped classes had slightly better growth on the conceptual measure than non flipped classes. But big caveats here. Um, we did data collection over two years and uh, Last year, the pandemic came and swept through like in March and April and May. So that obviously uh, impacted the school year and we had um, we had slightly more non flipped classes than flipped classes during the pandemic. Uh, so that negative impact, which was a negative impact, um, that hit the non flipped classes harder than it hit the flipped classes. So we're still having to kind of account for that in our analysis. Also, uh, just the caveat that you probably are already aware of, but we didn't tell the teachers to flip, they decided to flip. So that means they're not a random sample of teachers. They are people who said like, I'm the kind of person that wants to flip. And so there might be differences in the, the teacher or the setting for that kind of thing. But overall we did see if, if anything, there was positive correlation from the flip side towards the student outcomes of like how they feel about math and a little bit on the conceptual measure, if anything. Um, now, we, we said for our study, we need to get more specific than that. So really quickly, here's where we saw some things that are more specific. Um, we saw some positive things about homework and the independent group work, and we saw some negative things about the whole class format. So this is my last little bit here, and then I'll try to open it up. So homework completion correlates positively with the test post-test scores when controlling for pre-test scores. Independent work time also correlates positively with post-test scores, which means if the teacher just gave more independent work time, that seemed to have a positive correlation to the post-test scores when controlling for other things, um, which might be why there was a little bit of a positive correlation for flipped because flipped usually had more independent work time. So uh, there's kind of a, you know, they go, they co-vary flipping and having more independent work time, they co-vary and they both have some positive correlations to the um, outcomes. Now, interestingly, whole class discourse, whole class discourse, Spending time on that negative uh, correlated negatively with the post test scores. But our team said like, well, that's kind of expected, but that's why we coded for like the quality of the whole class discourse. That's why we coded for like, do you do conceptual discussions? Do you have students involved? Um, are you justifying it? Are you using representations? So we then said like, it's okay with our whole class discourse, we coded for the quality of that whole class discourse. Except for right now, it looks like the, the more emphasis on the conceptual and the more emphasis on integrating representations, it's even more negatively correlated. Um, so that's actually a question I wanna ask you all about it. It was like the more whole class discourse you do, it was negatively correlated and the higher you score on conceptualness, representations, justifications, um, then even worse, you did even worse on the post-test. Uh, that's what we're finding preliminary. We're actually still doing that analysis. So I'm gonna just go ahead and open up. I have some caveats, but um, I'm gonna just open it up to some questions. My main question we might go to right now is what's, what's up with that negative correlation between whole class discourse and the student outcomes? That's probably where I wanna open up right now. Um, I have a thought. Mm -hmm. um, so when the whole class discourse you you can't really control what gets said. And so when you allow like kind of lots of students to talk, the teacher is, you know, they're bringing in um, other ideas, other mathematics, maybe they learned other places, maybe things the teacher didn't intend to teach. The teacher's gonna comment on all of those things. And some students are trying to incorporate every single one of those things into, into what they need to do their tests and to do their exams, to do their homework, um, as opposed to te when you teach just one way, you know, it might not be this great math thing to just teach just one way, but you tend to see students doing really well. Or even in your, rec in your reviews, you might see a teacher, um, student saying, this teacher teaches too many ways. So it's like they're not able to focus on the one thing. Like, I just want to learn one way, teacher, and that's the way I want to do it. <laughs> but yeah. it's full class discourse. Okay, I've learned eight things here. I'm not entirely sure which one I'm supposed to apply. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely a plausible kind of explanation. Like there's clarity to 
a single vision from the teacher like of doing this and there's messiness of like bringing in you know more ideas and trying to make connections and stuff is messier um we we hypothesized that and that, and we thought it would show up mostly like on the procedural instrument and that's why we made sure we wanted to have a conceptual instrument because we thought like but maybe it will help the conceptual side even if it's sort of like not not benefiting the procedural side we're actually it looks like we're seeing it as negatively related to both procedural and conceptual so that like so for us we're still trying to figure that out but that's definitely one of the things at play um i will i didn't manage my time super well so we don't have enough time for all this discussion but we brought this to our advisory board and one of our advisory board members or actually two of them uh had what i think are pretty good ideas about it which is they are thinking about it from the student's perspective like how is the student receiving it when you go into like a whole class discussion so like all right we're gonna have a whole class discussion now these advisory board members predict that or they kind of uh suspected that a lot of the students are like this is actually a time for me to tune out um like i don't need the discussion parts uh, and so I'm going to tune out, not really listen. A couple students might stay involved, but a lot of them are like, like, get back to me when you actually have some problems you want me to solve. And I'm going to kind of tune out um, if it's the discussion part. That would make sense for like, okay, then it's kind of like wasted time. And that's why overall we have a negative relationship between whole class discourse and the outcomes is because it's kind of wasted time if a lot of students are like checking out and sort of like saying like, now we coded for engagement, but we can't really know what's going on in their mind. They might be tuned out in their mind. But the other thing in terms of like, well, why does it get worse when you're doing a like richer discussion of connections and representations and stuff? And they're like, oh, the reason that gets worse is because the students are like, this is not what I'm responsible for. Like, I need to be able to solve problems. So the more you go into conceptual, integrating representations, making connections, the more the student checks out because they're like, this is not, this is not what I signed up for, or this is not what I'm expected to do, like maybe on the assessments. Um, so then it's like, oh yeah, then they then they hardcore check out because they know that I don't really need to do this. So it's a little bit actually of what Belonely's saying, but um, I don't know, other reactions or thoughts people have on this. Did you call whole class uh, this, the quality more based on teacher saying or students response or equally? So for the whole class discourse, we code it based on the the whole public discussion. Um, so it's it's what's said, how it's said. Now the teacher does most of the talking. Um, but we, we, for whole class discourse, we coded it as what was the public contributions and ideas that were on the table. So, but uh, like, so <clears throat> let's say if a teacher and a student is really engaging and uh, everybody else is like zoom out for coding purpose, you will probably code it as a high quality cause it's kind of hard to, if it, it's hard to tell if other people zoom out, if you just watch the screen or sit there, stay quiet. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we tried to, um, we did, you know, to the best we could, we did try to look at, are the students at least appearing to still pay attention? So if they're like scrolling through their phone or something, that, like we did it, mark that down as less engagement. But yeah, we can't know exactly what they were thinking about, even if they were looking forward. Um, we did code for the number of students that contributed and the length of the student contribution. So we can tell like, what are the discussions that have lots of students talking versus what are the discussions that are almost entirely the teacher? Um, we have not parsed that uh, into this analysis yet. That's some of the stuff that we are working on now. But we do have the overall just quality codes of like the conceptual nature of it, the um, use of representations and justifications. Like we have that just for the discussion overall. And that's the one that's kind of, you know, having us scratch in our heads a little bit. And we're also like, we're trying to just follow the data and what's there. And we're trying to explain like the data that we have. But um, we're, we are afraid some math educators might not be happy when we start publishing this because a lot of math ed people say, if you really lean into the conceptual side and you have some discussions, the, the student achievement measures will just be at least the same as like procedural teaching, but you get these benefits of more empowerment, better attitudes, like, you know, more equitable inclusion of people's ideas and stuff. So it's kind of like the achievement stays at least as good. And then you have all these benefits in terms of equity and empowerment and all this stuff. But we're like, but what if it actually makes the achievement worse? Is it still worth it for the empowerment, the equity? We think it probably is still worth it, but that is a harder conversation to have with like the state government, with school districts, school boards. It's a harder discussion to say, your scores will, will be expected to go down, but you should do it anyway because it includes more people's ideas, it, it empowers the students and they will have better attitudes. That's true. That could be tricky.
but I'm going to go, I'm going to check with the hosts because I'm a little bit over time. I went a little bit long. Any last thoughts, questions for Sam before we conclude? I did have one last one. So you said that you controlled for the conceptual multiple representations of that whole class discussion. Did you control for whether students completed the homework or not as well? So not for the lesson. So we have a student survey that we did just once of the students and we ask them like in general, do you do the homework? In general, do you think your peers do the homework? So we get sort of a general sense of, is this like a class that does most of their homework or not? Mm -hmm. But we do not have it at the lesson level. Because that could be something that if they don't do the homework, then the teacher providing some kind of lecture or discussion on the conceptual features of the content, they aren't able to access that discussion. But if it's procedure, that's more accessible to them. And so then that could lead to better scores in certain measures. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and you also reminded me too of like this idea that if the teacher tends to do whole class discussions, then the students might think I don't need to do the homework because I'll just try to catch up with it when the teacher right. goes over it with like in the whole class. So that might also be kind of sending this mixed signals of don't worry about it now because I'll talk about it later. And then it's kind of like the student might be never really feels like they're accountable for the discussion. Um, so that could be a thing too. Versus like if you have homework and you have independent work time, it's kind of really clear what the student's responsible for and what they should be doing rather than sort of like, well, you can maybe, maybe do it there, maybe here, here. I'm also gonna talk about it later where it's kind of like when you have three opportunities for it, it's almost like you can lay back on all three of them. I would also be interested once you parse out further the nature of the discussions like you were talking about before, cause I'm still like, no, I don't believe you. I know you're telling me your data, but like, I just don't want to believe it. So I'm it's, like, it's yeah, let's hear more about the types of the discussions and really what the quality of those discussions yeah. works. I feel like, there's got to be some difference there, right? Like, you know, our we, training says there must be. Yeah, we really thought that once we sort of suspected the, the amount of time spent in discussions might be negatively correlated. But we thought once we started to account for quality that it would it would like tell a different story. And actually, it, it even if anything, right now, it looks like it worsened it. Like you have a better discussion. It was even worse. Now, again, it's correlational. I, I, it's not that that caused the, you know, but. Um, we're, we're trying to figure it out. It was not what we expected. Um, so yeah. And like I said, this analysis is actually ongoing. So, you know, it'll be curious to see what we really have when we take a really close look at it to write it up. Yeah. But if you just, uh, sorry to interrupt here, but if you just think about this question out of blue and just think about that, uh, there must be somehow a appropriate time, uh, let's say a point of reflection in terms of this idea of like class discourse, right? Because if you have 45 minutes class, if you discourse for 45 minutes, that's probably bad because there's need time to think and need time to do work. If mm -hmm. it's zero, it's very bad too. I mean, what's I mean, mm -hmm. the difference? Well, you have a class if there's no discourse. Just say, hey, it's assignment, let you go. So maybe, I don't know what's the best reasonable time, but maybe you're looking for something 15 or between 35 and it depends on certain the type of class, certain type of lessons. Yeah, that's... So it depends of if you're looking, I mean, I don't know what's the time split your data is Spraying, but I'm saying if, if you're comparing data from zero to 15, you probably see a positive correlation. If you're looking at, they already have a long discussion, they probably be there. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Like, so right now we've, we've just started this, we've did kind of like just overall, but you're right. There might be some kind of like bimodal kind of like thing going on underneath, which is just getting washed away by looking at it just like linearly. So yeah, th I'm going to bring that back to the team. Like, hey, let's actually parse this to like, you know, no whole class discourse, some sort of whole class discourse, and then like too much whole class discourse. And maybe once we kind of account for that, it might be a little bit different. Thanks. All right. Um, well, we'll end it there. Um, Sam, thank you for your time and for providing that talk and some thought provoking talk. And thank you to all of y'all who um, were able to attend. Uh, just a reminder, I think it was in the chat, uh, the Math Ed podcast, if you haven't checked that out, go ahead and do that. Some uh, interesting talks on that podcast. Um, and then this will be recorded. So if you wanted to revisit anything, I believe we'll be uploading this to the Mesa website um, in the coming week. But other than that, I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting for all of us.